Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking a little bit today about how we organize ourselves um, within our organizations, our businesses, to do innovation. And um, when we're organizing for innovation, one of the things I think is very helpful and useful is to take a systems perspective on the org. So what are systems? Systems are basically composed of semi-autonomous um, parts that look like they're functioning independently but are very interrelated. And um, structures that have a, a bunch of behaviors. And as we can see from this slide, there are many systems around us from ecosystems to our own human systems, our cult cultural systems, and of course the business systems in which we work on a daily basis. So in terms of analyzing the systems we work in, it's very helpful to take both an inside out and an outside in perspective. So we think of our, perhaps our user experience teams in which we operate. They tend to be fairly self-functioning units, but we have a lot of interdependencies, of course. We don't just do design. There's a business context. There's Profits must be made for the business to survive. Um, there are business requirements. There are technological requirements and many, many different requirements that impact how we can do user experience. So in terms of analyzing a system, very useful to take in both an inside out and an outside in perspective. So thinking about how does our group, our user experience teams operate in this larger context, but also what are the forces from the outside that are impacting us and how do they impact us and how can we influence in both directions. And these, 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 these words along the side here are, are when, you, when you look at the systems thinking literature, um, these, are the, these are the words, that, the terms that keep coming up, thinking about boundaries, right? The boundaries between things. What's happening at the boundary points in a system? What frictions and synergies exist at those boundary points? What overlap and redundancies? And as you think through how your UX team operates in this organizational context, it makes it, makes, make, makes, allows you to think more systematically about how you want to do innovation. And um, I'll be talking a little bit later about considering our UX teams as innovation competency centers. Another thing that's very useful is when thinking systematically, including a lot of different perspectives, right? So if we're thinking, considering mountains, mountainous terrain as a project maybe we have to design for or plan for, if we include a geologist in, 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 our, in our project, they're gonna come to the, they're gonna talk to us about mountains in a very different way than we might look at it if we were talking to a cartographer or perhaps someone who actually had to uh, live, perhaps fight, or do some type of activity in a cold mountainous terrain. Each of those, each of those people is gonna bring, bring a very different perspective, a more systematic, more holistic perspective that allows us to do innovation more effectively. Then there are disciplinary blinders, right? We all operate in these organizational contexts with our teams where we have our own languages, um, our own theories, our own um, jargon, our own cultures. And these can also function as, as blinders, right? And oftentimes, even on my team, you know, we'll talk about those damn product managers and, you know, the fact that they don't really get the users, or maybe the, maybe the the fact of the matter is they're thinking about users in a different way than we in UX think about users. And those damn technologists, they don't understand users because you know, they're always thinking about code and systems architecture and how to make things scale and they don't think about users. Well, maybe they think about users in a different way than we do. We all bring different perspectives to the mix. So organizational blinders can really get in the way. It's a less systematic um, approach just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about 
how you organize yourself to do innovation. So let's think about developing a systems perspective on the outputs of a UX team. And, and, and these, are, these are sort of common things I think we could probably all agree on. Maybe you have different outputs in your team, different things that you provide to your organization, different ways of communicating. But it's very helpful to think about how all of those outputs impact the others in your team around, around you. For example, we all say we want to do user research, right? Okay, so who else, who else wants to do research in our organization? Well, marketing people, product managers, even executives are very, very interested in the, the, the products of research. So can we look for synergies and ways to do research that bring all of these viewpoints into the mix and allow us to collaborate and build a more robust and shared knowledge base? Thinking about, for example, another aspect, let's say you're building some prototypes, okay? Building some nice prototypes, maybe well rendered. Well, could those be used to actually help your sales team to sell product before it exists? Well, in fact, it can. Um, in fact, I've done it. My team has done it. And so, if we can think more systematically about the things that are, the information that's coming into our teams and what's coming out of our teams, and how we can synergize that with the rest of the organization and their needs, we can actually have more effective UX teams and get involved at earlier stages of discussion and, and more strategic stages of discussion in business planning. So when you're thinking about your team, your UX team, kind of take a foreign, uh, a foreign policy approach. Think about it from a, a, a nation's perspective, right? Um, your UX team is like a little nation, and the other organizations are other nations. How do you interact with those teams? How do you influence each other? Perhaps create um, what's known as an influencing map. Thinking about, in a sort of strategic fashion, what are the needs of the other teams? And if I have to go to them to ask them for support, what might be their objections? Thinking through these things before you even, even go talk to these teams gives you a broader perspective. It's actually an interesting exercise to perform within a UX team, to use it as a, a brainstorming, team building activity, to think systematically about the whole rest of the org. Or doing organizational audits, where you go around and you interview other teams at the, at the company to find out what are their needs? What keeps them awake at night? Think about it as internal user research. You're looking at the target audience that you're working with every day, your colleagues. They're the ones who are going to help you build product. We don't, we, don't, we don't build product as UX people, typically. We're not engineers. Some of us are, but mostly we don't build products. We, design, we mostly provide research and design. And we have requirements coming in from the business side, from product managers. What are their needs from a user experience team? I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, and, and talk about um, innovation activities. And um, I really like to think about innovation as, as kind of an organizational renewal process. How does a company refresh itself, right? A company builds products, it ships products, it has business models so it can put products out in the world, sell those products, make profit, and live, continue to live as an organism, right? But it has to evolve. A business exists in a, in, a, in, in a broader context of competition, of changing market needs, of technology, changing technologies. It's an evolving world, right? New social needs. Um, so businesses continually need to reinvent themselves, rethink themselves. So what I'm going to talk about next is a little bit more of a taxonomy, and I'm a kind of a taxonomy junkie or a framework junkie. Um, I, I, I find they sort of help me organize my thinking and, and, and st not only that, but stretch my thinking and prompt my thinking. 
Um, so when we talk about innovation, I think there's, there's, there's sort of three broad categories that are useful to think about. Um, the core innovation. And for those of us that work in product companies, this is, you know, we've got products where we're continually evolving them, changing them, and I think it's well illustrated by Apple at one point um, when they started reinventing themselves kind of around core innovation through in industrial design, nice colors, forms, etc. Um, and then there's what's known as adjacent innovation. This is where you're really kind of trying to exp expand out into new markets, adjacent markets, things that are proximal to where you're doing business uh, today. I think that's pretty well uh, typified by the, um, by the music player, right? Um, the iPod. So Apple, there was a you know, well-populated space of music, digital music devices, and Apple came in, and they changed the game. Now, they changed it systematically, right? Because not only did they introduce a player, they also introduced a system for music delivery. And then there's transformational, where you're really going after transforming a market, sometimes known as disruptive innovation. Um, and I think very well uh, typified by the, by the iPhone. Completely disrupted the phone industry. Changed the game entirely. Right, before we were all using Blackberries and Nokia devices and, you know, in comes this phone that nobody had ever seen before. So having this kind of language so we can talk about innovation and what, what type of innovation are we really doing? Is it incremental, kind of the core stuff, or are we really going broad and, and, and trying to disrupt entire markets? This is another, now we're kind of going down a level, looking at an innovation taxonomy. This is actually, um, slide is based on the work of the Doblin Group. They put out a, a um, very compelling book, 10 Types of Innovation. Can't recommend it enough. Um, it's a book that's actually designed by designers, so it's quite visual. Um, and they have a very interesting systematic way of presenting um, innovation and thinking about innovation that, that I, I have found um, tremendously helpful. So if we sort of look at these different categories from configuration through offerings through experience, you may not agree on the terminology, but they, they, they look at things like profit model. I won't drain this slide. I'll, I'll make sure it's up online if you guys want to look at it or you can go buy the book. Um, they look at things like profit model. How, how do we make money? And there's different ways of innovating around making money. Yesterday we had a, uh, a talk about Bitcoin. Okay, there's different, different ways you can, you can um, charge, right? There's freemium models, um, there's ad supported models. There's lots of different ways to make money and you can innovate. In the same way, you can network with other businesses. How do you come together to perhaps offer new services that you couldn't do on your own? Partnering, right? Um, structure, how you align your talents, and then processes. What's, how, how can we change our, our internal processes as a business? For one example is Lean Startup or Lean UX. Um, it's quite, quite popular now. Um, where I come from in California, in the Silicon Valley. It's all the rage, in fact, amongst startups. They're all doing lean startup, or most of them anyway. Um, and that changes how we do things, how you approach business. Um, product performance and product system, these are sort of classics. These are things that designers typically focus on and think about when they do innovation. Um, and then there's, there, there's a, some other service and channel, brand and customer engagement. And one of the things I think that's kind of interesting when I looked at this the first time and started thinking about it, I realized that you know, UX prior to 2000, I felt was really focused around product and, 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 and systems. And then from about 2001, about the time of the dot-com boom and services coming online and websites and more cloud-based models, we started to see service, channel, branding, engagement all being discussed more amongst designers in the UX community. And then I wonder, you know, does the future lie ahead for us too? 
design profit models, network structures, and processes? Can we innovate? Can we influence innovation in these areas as UX designers? So thinking about building an innovation culture, okay, it's not just going to happen it, 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 unless you happen into a company where they're, that's kind of their founding DNA and they're, they're all about innovation. You're probably not going to start over there, right, on the far right. Innovation sometimes enters particularly larger organizations that have more established business models. As, as, as a foreign entity. And why is that? Well, because as a business does business, it builds supply chains, it builds ways of making money. It, it, they start out innovative, right? But then in order to do business, they lock down into certain systems, certain ways of functioning and operating. And um, in order to renew themselves, they have to disrupt. So sometimes they, they get stale. Um, and so, Innovation comes as more of an outside entity. It's more sort of a, a, a part of or peripheral to um, the main organizational thrust. And then what we're trying to do when we, when, when we innovate is to get innovation at the core of the organization and then ultimately push it out into basically the core function of the innovation so that it really operates at all levels of an organization. So I encourage you guys to think about your um, UX teams as innovation competency centers, right? It's at the core of what we do. We're all about innovation, whether it's, it's, it's core adjacent or transformational. That, that's what a UX team is doing. We're trying to renew the organizations we operate in. And as someone once said, the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. You'll find the same thing with innovation within organizations, right? Organizations are hierarchical. They're, um, you've got semi-autonomous units. Um, they all function a bit differently. They all have their own different cultures. Um, but they're interrelated. And so in in innovation may operate at different levels across the, the, the company, but ultimately it should be informed by feedback coming from your outside world, your customers, your, your users. Um, whether you're a product, service, whatnot. So one thing I'd also like to encourage is this notion of using scenario-based design, but not considering single scenarios, but multiple scenarios. So what does that look like? If we think about where we are today and some future time that's out there, some plausible futures, plausible, is it likely? Probably not, but you know, we can imagine it, so it's plausible. But if things kind of keep going as they, as they go, they're sort of evolving slowly, we'll get to what a, what's a probable future, right? Unless we think about things more disruptively. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is to think more broadly about what are preferable futures, but not just one preferable future, because we can't really know what the future is. It's impossible to predict. It's dynamic, it's always Things are always happening, right? Um, some pandemic, sorry. There'll be some sort of pandemic outbreak that changes the future, who knows? I don't know. Um, but when you're doing scenario-based planning, and I could teach a whole day tutorial on that, it's, it's, it's too deep a topic to go into here, but, but basically what you're doing is you're considering, brainstorming, what are, what are the social, technological, environmental, economic, and um, uh, competitive, political and competitive environments that may possibly constitute a future. And then developing scenarios and telling stories around these different possible scenarios. And you can use it as a way of planning for different outcomes that might happen in your businesses. Looks like I'm going to finish early, so maybe I'll catch this up a little. Or I could take a question or two. Um, so again, I, 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 you know, design thinking, I'm trained as a designer. It's what I've done my whole career. Um, 
I'm all about experimentation, but not just experimentation in our design, but experimentation in, in our organizations and how we organize ourselves and how we interact. And looking at things as, looking at everything that we do as a set of experiments, right? And, and seeing what the outcomes are and, and having that feedback loop to gauge, well, what's, what's really happening in the system <laughs> when I try this new initiative? Does it, does it, does it get traction? Does it fall flat? Um, what, what happens and, and how do I need to tweak and adjust whatever I'm doing, however I'm interacting, however my team is interacting, however I'm dealing with customers or not dealing with customers. Treat it as an experiment. Stay open, flexible. And what that allows you to do is to pivot as necessary. So that's, that's all I've got. I'm a little bit early. I guess I could take a question or two, or I can catch, catch us up on the speakers, whatever the, uh, the preference is. Yeah, question? Sort of. Yes. Yes. Actually, so that, that slide is, is heavily borrowed, if not stolen, from uh, the Design Management Institute. So they, they use it to talk about design. I use it to talk about innovation. And it definitely maps to a capability maturity model for design. So, and in fact, they have a fourth drawing where the yellow circle is completely outside the gray. So it's almost like a foreign entity, right? So you could even think of it as sort of like um, a virus invading a cell, right? It goes in and it sort of takes over the cell. It's kind of a nice, nice diagram. I like it a lot. Questions? Okay, thank you.